always, I've, I, I, Harry and I have been on conference programs together a number of times and we always speak with one voice. I actually feel very encouraged because I think the fact that the focus of our conference today is about community and connections shows that there is a sea change. We do have some utter craziness going on in governments, but I do believe that there is a movement and we are it. So we need to be confident in that. So let me see if I can get this to work. Do I just press the mirror? No? Yeah, yeah. We are pack animals. So our biology supports a community focus. Um, mm, uh, wait a minute. That's it. There we go. Now this could be my family. It's not actually a picture of my family, but I spent uh, two and a half weeks in the Caribbean recently. We had a big family reunion. Because I come from a really big network in the Bahamas, I understand the importance of extended family. That is the normal human state. This is how we support parents. This is how we support parents to support children. And I think we've really lost that basic understanding of our biology in the West. So we need to get it back. Um, a pack is made up of attachment relationships across ages. Um, we've got the early relationships with our parents as we grow. Um, peers come into it. I don't know if this clicker is losing its battery, but anyway. At, at the core, this is all about stress, calibration and soothing. It's about how we actually comfort and soothe one another in difficult times. So it all comes back to attachment, which this is what attachment is about. The Centre on the Developing Child, um, based around Harvard, that's a virtual network, they talk about attachment in terms of the baby serves and the adult returns. So I'm just going to get into that in a little bit of detail, of detail because that is basic human instinct and it's actually really easy when nothing gets in the way my infant mental health mentor was Christine Puckering and she always said we don't need to teach parenting there's no need to teach parenting if parenting's not working it's because there are barriers and we need to understand what the barriers are and remove them because this is natural and this is a paper that really influenced me it's quite a few years old now um, it's called the adaptive calibration model of stress responsivity and I, I apparently um, use this as an answer to the adoptive parents who are worried about their children's brain development because actually our brains are adapted to, to deal with stress um, especially when we're young um, and what what this what this paper this paper said, and I love this quote, children have evolved to respond in biologically adaptive ways to harsh and unsupportive family environments, not just loving and supportive ones. I think that's really important. So if you're an adoptive parent or a foster carer or a kinship carer, and your child grew up in a harsh and unsupportive environment, just remember that your child's whole physiology is designed to withstand that. And I believe, and you know, no one has done the research on young children. Most of this research has been done in middle-aged adults. I have a strong suspicion that with children, right up to and beyond adolescence, you know, our brains are still uh, myelinating, um, they're, they're changing very rapidly in adolescence, up to about the age of 35. There's huge scope for change. You know, our brains are mutable. So just remember that. So why is stress calibration so, so important across development? And this is just my very basic metaphor for that. I like to think about a stress thermostat. It's a bit like the thermostat that controls the heating in our house. If we are getting up in the morning, we haven't really woken up yet. We're pretty sluggish, we're pretty sleepy. Certainly for me until I've had my coffee, I'm actually not really used very much you know so we're not ready for action until we've kind of got going so we've actually got to get a little bit of kind of anxiety stroke arousal it's kind of the same thing at that lower level before we can be in a situation of optimal flow you know you've got to kind of get yourself ready ready for action and then you can really think you know we've all experienced that your brain is in that kind of optimum flow position 
But all of us, every single one of us, will experience traumas. I mean, we, we just will. We'll experience the death of someone very close to us. Sometimes it can be sudden. We'll experience, you know, things like a car accident. Awful things will happen to us throughout our life. That is normal. And when awful things happen, our physiology goes into flight, fight, flight, or freeze. And again, that's normal. And then we'll go into restitution. So, you might even be shouted at by your boss. Hopefully not if you're my boss, because I really don't believe in that. So we'll go into, then we'll go into relaxation and restitution. I mean, you might want to think about how we do that. But that cycle between fight, flight, and freeze and relaxation and restitution is normal and it, it will repeat for all of us during our life. And when it repeats, eventually we will develop a healthy system, a healthy stress system, a healthy thermostat that's robust to challenges. And actually there's some research that's shown that people who end up with kind of hyperactive stress systems, sometimes those are people who've experienced a lot of adversity, but sometimes it's people who've not experienced any adversity. So I think the thinking is, is really now that you've got to experience a bit of adversity in order to kind of prime your system, which kind of makes sense, you know. I'm not really keen on this idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger because sometimes it can nearly kill you and it doesn't make you stronger but but there's something in that there's something in we that that cycle is normal and we should embrace it and realize that and I think in some sometimes in western psychology we forget that this is normal and that we think that we're kind of permanently scarred and we can never recover across the animal kingdom and we are animals that is not the case we can recover and the way that we go into relaxation and, and restitution will change across the lifespan. When you're a tiny baby, you need parents for that. And adoptive, and foster, adoptive parents and foster carers will know that often children who haven't had that real surround sound nurture early in life, they're still seeking it later. And that's why I think therapies like Theraplay can be really helpful because you might have a 14-year-old who still needs to play pat a cake and you've got to find a non-patronising way to do it. So... We, we need we need to find a way of plugging in with parents when we're younger in order to really develop fully. But in a kind of typical stress response system developing, by the time we're elderly, we'll have actually found ways of doing it for ourselves. And this is just the picture of a, a Norwegian woman, elderly woman in her summer house. You know, we find ways of nurturing ourselves. And again, I go back to the extended family. The most ordinary way to do that is with our extended family. And it was fascinating being in the Bahamas on my birthday, actually. Um, we had a big family dinner. And one of my cousins that I actually hadn't known that well until this recent trip, because there's so many cousins, he was there with two beautiful young women who I had assumed were both his daughters. It turned out that one was his biological daughter, the other was a kind of step. We talk in the Bahamas about your sister, cousin, auntie, child. Everyone's related. And she was a very distant relative whose mum had really got into a lot of difficulties. And um, she was thriving in the extended family. And her mum was in the States at community college getting her own life back on track. That's how families are supposed to work. When I was a young doctor, I worked in Guatemala. And I was the GP for indigenous communities who were really in absolute poverty. But... At that time, there was a belief in the West that mums were supposed to be kind of there for their babies 24-7. It was all focused on mums. Actually, when I went to do postnatal visits in Guatemala into those really, really materially deprived homes, you could guarantee 99 times out of 100, the young mum would be sleeping in her hammock and somebody else in the family would be holding the baby because there were people around to hold the baby. It could be gran, it could be older brother, it could be granddad. I remember one granddad kind of holding a baby and saying, do you know what, saying to the baby, do you know what, see if I had breasts, I could feed you. <laughs> but I'll, I'll pass you back to mum later. That is our biological ordinary state, and we need to remember that. So we know in this room that some young people and some adults get kind of stuck in the red zone. What does that mean? You're overwhelmed, you're agitated, you have brain freeze. Now, we will all have experienced that from time to time. You know, you've really practised for that uh, theory test. 
and you know you've done the multiple choice and you know you can do it and then you get into the test and your brain just freezes, you can't remember anything about the road signs, etc. We've all experienced that. But what if that is your ordinary state? And if it gets really bad, then you may be in a state of constant either rage. Many of the young men in prison, we've actually done this just recently, about to publish a study um, of uh, mental health and relationship-focused problems in young men in Pullman prison. Some of those young men are in a constant state of high alert and rage. Some are in a constant state of withdrawal and not reaching out um, to get help. And the, the, the ultimate, unfortunately, is, is, is suicide. And suicide rates are very high in uh, th that group of young people. So what is it that causes some people to get stuck in the red zone? So it can be trauma. And there are trauma-related mental health problems, psychiatric disorders, and one is reactive attachment disorder, where children or young people just do not seek help and they won't, they won't accept it either. And the other is what we call disinhibited social engagement disorder. And this is where, this is a research assistant of mine in um, an orphanage in South Africa. And what she's experiencing there is indiscriminate behaviours and children who've been very severely abused and neglected can become indiscriminate where they don't go to special adults, they'll kind of go to anyone. Um, so some children can have problems seeking accept or accepting comfort and can become kind of hypervigilant where they're wary and watch watchful and they, they're ambivalent about relationships. And Harry talked about the importance of unpredictability. And I guess if, you're, if your life, if your early attachment experiences have been unpredictable, then you yourself are probably going to find it very hard to see the world as a predictable place. So that's very important. Or they can become indiscriminately um, in inverted commas friendly and often you get these two things together you'll get children who don't reach out for help they won't accept comfort but they'll wander off with someone who says come and see my puppies and put themselves at risk and these are actually developed in my in my view these kind of behaviors are real developmental emergencies because we all need people to help us to thrive and to grow. And so if you don't have that, then you're not, get, you're not getting your developmental needs met. We need special adults. And my other job when I was in Guatemala, I was also an orphanage doctor, and I noticed the difference in those materially deprived families. Everyone knew the children's names. In the orphanage, if I tried to pres prescribe amoxicillin for Diego's skin infection, it was very difficult to get anyone to give that to Diego. People could, in the orphanage workers, could kind of think about all of the children as a group, but it was very hard to get anyone to single out Diego. So Di what Diego didn't have was people really keeping him in mind. Nelson Mandela talked about having several mothers. He was actually from a, 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 in a polygamous family, but you can bet your Bob and Dolly, they all knew Nelson. All of those mothers knew his name, and that's very different. The other thing that we need to think about is temperament and neurodevelopment. And temperament is what we're born with. Our personalities then develop on top of that, but temperament's the way we are. And children differ from birth. Neurodevelopmental problems and neurodevelopmental conditions are not necessarily problematic. I, I'll, I'll fess up, I actually have a diagnosis of ADHD and it's really served me well. I'm highly energetic. I'm, I'm kind of looking out for things in the environment, you know, got my little antenna because I might not be concentrating on my emails. It can work very well. I suspect many of the great advances in uh, life have been due to people with autism who, you know, probably wouldn't have invented the wheel if somebody hadn't had a really fo a, a big focus on that. So neurodevelopmental conditions are not necessarily problems, but neurodevelopmental problems can make life very stressful. Hyperactivity, my goodness, anyone that's got a hyperactive child will know. Children with sensory sensitivities can be very difficult to parent. Now, I mentioned I have ADHD. Well, back in the 1970s, nobody knew that girls could have ADHD, but my mum knew. 
she knew that I was different. And believe it or not, I mean, her, her and my dad, they used to tell us this a very loving, funny story. They went to the doctors and said, we, we're not sleeping. And I was prescribed sodium amytal, which is like a horse tranquilizer. <laughs> um, you know, they don't, you don't even use it in adults now. And they went to the pharmacy and the pharmacist said, you can't prescribe this for a baby. This is an adult dose. So they said, phone the doctor. They could hear both sides of the conversation. The, the doctor said, you don't know this baby. So in the end, they gave it to me. It made no difference. In the end, my mother took it on a Monday. My father took it on a Tuesday. My mother took it on a Wednesday. They slept. But what's important about that is that they got support, even if it was maybe not the support we'd, we'd give now, but they got support from a, from a supportive GP. They were able to sleep. They didn't abuse me. Now, I think that's a really salutary tale because some of the birth families who have whose children have um, come into the care system actually had a very difficult parenting task and they may have had neurodevelopmental conditions themselves and we need to remember that. Some children are temperamentally more sensitive to the environment than others and you'll have heard the orchids and dandelions metaphor. I actually prefer the metaphor of diamonds and gold coins because they're both really precious. But diamonds don't, are, are, are not as easily damaged by the environment. Gold coins do get tarnished, but if they get the right support, they can thrive and actually get interest. So it's just to remind you that children who are sensitive are also sensitive to the positive things in the environment. So if you're an adoptive parent, your parenting will be making a really big difference to sensitive children. This is just one example, but fearlessness is a really good example. Fearless children can have very divergent paths, depending on what happens. If fearless children have good enough parenting, which doesn't have to be perfect, then actually they can go on to have great fun in life. They apparently earn more money. There's been a study that's shown that fearless children, you know, if all else is equal, often actually earn more money in life. However, if fearless children do not experience good enough parenting and this was a study a fantastic study where they actually had independent researchers looking at video interaction between parents and their children and if those independent researchers said this parenting is actually you know not good enough then actually those children are at greater risk of developing persistent aggression and persistent aggression can be changed there are interventions that work but it's hard um, and also they are at greater risk of, of suicide because actually a lot of, a lot of children self-harm, but actually you're at high risk of suicide if you're also fearless, which kind of makes sense. So I, I mentioned that because some of these things are inherited and then the environment can actually lead to very different outcomes, but it's not deterministic because there's still change, there's change possible across life. So again, let's just summarize what can get stuck in the red zone trauma. But don't forget, it's not just those one-off traumas. We're talking about really extreme, overwhelming chronic trauma and neurodevelopmental conditions and both. And we've actually done some research that's shown that children who've experienced abuse and neglect are at much higher risk of also having these heritable neurodevelopmental conditions, um, probably, probably because they're more difficult to parent. And then we also know that if you're not great at calibrating your stress responses, one of the, one of the real symptoms of that is temper tantrums. <laughs> I mean, it, that all makes parenting even harder. It takes two to tangle. Attachment relationships are made up of two parts. There's the attachment behaviours when the baby reaches out to be soothed. And then there's the caregiving behaviours where we, we soothe. On the attachment behaviour side, um, neurodevelopmental conditions can kind of get in the way if a child is also struggling with concentration, is hyperactive. Um, it might be harder for that child to plug in and then it might be harder for the parent to respond. So it's just accepting that some parents have a, a, a bigger, a bigger challenge. How do we, how do we sort this out? And actually, 
this is not difficult. This is simple stuff if we actually just understand our natural human herd state. Support stressed parents. And we can support stressed parents and extended families. And I'm really excited about the, uh, the, the, the project that a Scottish Attachment and Action is doing with ethnic minority families. So I think we've got a lot to learn. I think, I think Western societies have a lot to learn. Um, if families are isolated, if parents are isolated, there are other ways. Actually, parenting, when I say not parenting groups to train parents, parents that, groups that, that get parents together to, to learn from each other, to support each other, to ask each other what you need. I do think there is a role for parent training but I think it's always an advanced parenting driving licence because parents can do this. It's, it's a natural state. Any parent on any bus anywhere in the world can do this. And we mustn't be patronising. It's not up to me to teach anyone else how to parent. But if a parent has got a, a child with ADHD, then there are some tips. If a child has a parent with autism, then there are some tips. If a child has a parent who's got ADHD and autism and has also experienced abuse and neglect, then there are some tips. And it's that kind of ethos. And we must be respectful of parents and realise that any additional training, is a, it's an advanced licence. <laughs> and it's not a licence. It's, it's, it, it's not, you're not being, you know, you're not being told now. It's just, it's just extra, extra tips relationship-focused interventions, and there's really good evidence. There have been big meta-analyses that have shown that if we focus on relationships, really focus on relationships, then that can help parents improve their sensitivity, that can improve attachment relationships. Um, and then also children may need other treatments. They may need, a, may need an autism-friendly environment in school. They may need stimulant medication for their ADHD. It's got to be both and. Often we have the, the, the question in clinical services, is this trauma? Is it ADHD or autism? It's often both and. So let's remember that some children are harder to parent than others. Let's stop blaming parents. Let's help them sooner. Let's harness the power of families and communities. Actually, it's not complicated. It's what we do naturally. And that's all I want to say. And I'd be really grateful for your thoughts. <laughs>